Wonderful to have you join us tonight. And of course, for those of you here in Dunedin, it's lovely to see you all uh, so early in the semester and on such a beautiful evening when you could be outside by the river or something else. It's wonderful that you can come and join us for some uh, serious theological uh, stimulation tonight. So one welcome to you all. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. And it gives me a particularly great pleasure on behalf of the Department of Theology and Religion and the Centre for Theology and Public Issues to welcome to the University Professor Gerald West, who is Senior Professor in the School of Religion, Philosophy and Classics at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Pietermaritzburg, South Africa. Professor West joins us to deliver this year's four De Kaal Distinguished Lecture Series lectures and it's also a very great pleasure to welcome his wife, the Reverend Professor Beverly Haddad, to the university. Beverly is Associate Professor in Theology and Development at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, where she's also the Director of CHART, a collaborative for HIV and AIDS, Religion and Theology. Professor Haddad joins us as the Harold Turner Fellow in the Centre for Theology and Public Issues. Tēnā kōrua, naumai hairemai ki te whare over the next four weeks, Professor West will be delivering a series of lectures on the theme, The Bible as a Site of Struggle, as well as a seminar next Wednesday afternoon, hosted by the Department of Sociology, Gender and Social Work, entitled Resisting Violence Against Women and Children and Recovering a Redemptive Masculinity. Uh, that seminar will be at 12 p.m. next Wednesday, the 7th of March, in Archway East, Room 11, and I'm afraid I'm not entirely sure where that is, but we have people here who can tell you. <laughs> These talks grow out of a long history of engagement by Professor West with the contextual reading, study, and appropriation of the Bible, particularly in the context of South Africa and Africa more broadly, which has yielded a very large number of publications, perhaps most notably in recent times his major 2016 book, The Stolen Bible, from Instrument of Imperialism to African Icon, published by E.J. Brill. There's a copy of that in the library, um, in case you haven't read it. <laughs> a very significant dimension of Professor West's work has been, and continues to be, what has come to be known as contextual Bible study, particularly through the work of the Ujamaa Center for Community Development and Research, which is an interface between socially engaged biblical and theological scholars, organic intellectuals, and local communities of the poor, working class, and marginalized, which aims to use biblical and theological resources for individual and social transformation. Among those biblical resources is the harrowing story in 2 Samuel of the rape of Tamar, which is the basis for the Tamar campaign and the resulting Tamar contextual Bible study which is aimed at addressing gender-based violence using the resources of scripture. And there are some wonderful resources there uh, on the Ujamaa Center website, which you can download. Well, we look forward very much to what promises to be an engaging, challenging, and stimulating series of lectures. So please welcome me, all of you, in wel in join me, all of you, in welcoming. Good evening, um, and thank you so much for coming to this lecture tonight. Um, a particular thanks to Dr. James Harding. James, thank you for that gracious introduction. As head of the Department of Theology and Religion, a special word of thanks to David Toombs, Professor David Toombs, uh, from the Center for Theology and Public Issues. David has been the um, catalyst for bringing me out here, and, and David, thank you so much for all the work you've done, and to your colleague, Miss uh, Cara Jane Smith, who's really looked after us from an administrative perspective. I'd like also to thank all of those from the other departments in humanities who've supported my coming here and being here. It, it's been wonderful to have a sense that I'm here as part of a wider discourse within the humanities. 
In these four lectures, um, I'm going to be looking at aspects of the Bible as a site of struggle and trying to uh, reflect on what that means for us, particularly now, after liberation in South Africa. So I'm going to be moving slowly towards that. And I'm hoping that out of this work, a companion volume to my stolen Bible will emerge, which will be um, focused on the Bible as a site of struggle. As, as uh, James Harding said in his, in his, in his introduction, uh, these lectures bring together my, my interests in African biblical interpretation, but also my commitment to working within local communities of the poor and marginalized for transformation, where the Bible is a significant text, a significant and often sacred resource. I'm going to begin by looking at um, some African anecdotes about the Bible. The first one I think you'll be, mo you'll be familiar with. When the white man came to our country, he had the Bible and we blacks had the land. The white man said to us, let us pray. After the prayer, the white man had the land and we blacks had the Bible. I've got a beautiful uh, piece of art which reflects this as well. This has been captured in so many ways the story is told throughout Africa, this anecdote. What you may not be familiar with is this response. Now, um, Desmond Tutu has said this on a number of occasions, often jokingly, right? He, he, he's got a lovely sense of humor. But he says this, and I think lying behind the humor is the reality of a Bible that is deeply ambiguous, but a Bible that is deeply African. Okay. And some of my colleagues who, 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 who banter with me about this will speak of the Bible being as African as football. And by that I mean soccer, uh, the, the round ball, right? Um, that how would you take football away from Africans? People would say, you can't do that. It belongs to us. And I think the Bible is something similar in our context. Ambiguous, both come with colonialism, but they've been appropriated by Africans. The se second anecdote, I think, will be unfamiliar to most of you. Um, and in my book, The Stolen Bible, I engage with this anecdote in great detail. This is, these are the words of Isaiah Shembe. Okay, this is not reported by anyone. It is, comes from a notebook which captured the story as preached by Isaiah Shembe. Isaiah Shembe preached the sermon which he calls the Liberating Bible in, 19, in 1933. He is the founder of an African independent church or African independent religion. It's not quite clear whether it's a church or a religion. And he is the founder of Ibandla Lama Nazareta, the congregation or the community of the Nazarites. And this is a portion of his, of his, um, of his story. I'll read it. Most of you will have already read it. In olden times, there were two mighty nations who were fighting over a certain issue. In their war, the one conquered the other and took away all and took all their cattle away. They took even their children captive and put them in the school of the victorious nation. They were give, given some work to do in the morning before they went to school. In the house of the Pope, there was a Bible which was kept under lock by him and only read by himself. On a certain day, he, that is the Pope, had to go for a few weeks to another place, and he forgot to lock the Bible up at home. When the boys were sweeping his home, they found the Bible unlocked. When they began to read it, they discovered that their nation, which had been demolished so badly by the war, could never be restored unless they would get a book like this one. When they came back from school, they bought a copy book and copied the whole Bible. This, the, the parable, or the story Isaiah Shembe tells to his congregation, to his community, carries on about how these boys then go home to their parents and pass on 
this copied Bible to their parents and do not leave home until the police come to look for them and then bring them back. And the parable story then goes on in other directions. What is fascinating about this story is it is the story of the Stolen Bible. And I've borrowed this notion for my book, The Stolen Bible, from Isaiah Shembe, and I want to acknowledge um, him for that very significant contribution. Isaiah Shembe was not trained by missionaries. He rejected missionary Christianity. It was God who taught him to read, he claims, so that he could read the Bible. So here is an African um, emerging in the late 18, early 1900s, He's a prophet, healer, dreamer. And the one thing he takes from missionary Christianity is the Bible, and he rejects the rest. And he uses the Bible together with his indigenous culture to construct a community. Ibandla Lama Nazareta, the community of the Nazarites. What is remarkable about um, Shembe is that the Bible is central and missionary Christianity is entirely absent. So for those of you who have some understanding of Christianity, there is no trinity, for example, in the theology of Isaiah Shembe. He doesn't connect at all, except perhaps with some of the hymns. He loved hymns, and he wrote many hymns himself. Uh, hymns, the hymns were given to him in dreams very often, uh, directly from God. And today, much of the liturgical life of his community is framed by, by hymns. So here then is a separation of the Bible from Christianity. And that idea is central to my book, The Stolen Bible. I'm not going to focus on it now. But, but my argument in The Stolen Bible is that it, you can, from an African perspective, separate the Bible from Christianity. The Bible is a bit like the gun which Africans attempted to separate from colonial forces. He has another object of power taken, stolen, separated from the very colonial powers that bring it. Now, what each of these anecdotes indicates, I think, is the following. That the Bible in some way represents Christianity, although, as I've said, can be separated from it. That the Bible is a component of missionary colonialism. It comes with missionary colonialism. In both cases, there's an ambiguity about the Bible. The Bible takes away land. The Bible takes away cattle. The Bible takes away children. The Bible is central, in other words, to sociocultural and socioeconomic systems of exploitation. And, and, and I'm going to emphasize this notion of system or systemic or structural in this lecture and the ones that follow. It's very much a part of the tradition. Would uh, that include apartheid? Sorry? Would that include apartheid? Yes. Yeah. As a system, yes. Apartheid would be a very good understanding of what a system is. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That, that, that is exactly what I mean by a system. What these anecdotes also indicate is that the Bible has been appropriated by Africans. Desmond Tutu's uh, jocular, we got the better deal, or Isaiah Shembe's uh, stolen Bible, and that the Bible is a site of struggle. There's contestation going on here in different kinds of ways, and I want to tease out some of those ways in um, the next, this lecture and the next couple of lectures. But I want to locate the Bible more fully now within systems of exploitation, and I'm going to emphasize economic systems this evening. And, and as I go along, you'll see that in some ways I have a, a, a particular commitment to the fundamental reality of economics and economic systems as they shape African lives. But we will also look at other systems the patriarchal system, heteropatriarchy, uh, in the lectures that, that come. But tonight, I want to emphasize particularly economic systems. And I acknowledge here 
um, the work of Sophie de Blanche, uh, one of our economic um, thinkers in South Africa, it comes out of a sort of liberation tradition uh, because he passed away, I think, this last, in the last couple of weeks. So we want to remember him. Um, he's done important work coming out of the white Afrikaner community and yet speaking back to that community and offering all of us in the liberation struggle uh, resources. South Africa, I want to argue, is characterized by the following time-entangled systemic relationships. This notion of time-entangled comes from Akhil Mbembe, the African scholar on, on, on the post-colony, on post-colonialism, and he speaks of the African time as a time of entanglement. I, I love that, and I'm going to play on that a little bit later as well. So in our time-entangled history, what are these systems that have shaped our lives as South Africans. Well, the first one is a mercantile and feudal system institutionalized by Dutch colonialism during the second half of the 17th and most of the 18th century, beginning in 1652. My book, The Stolen Bible, begins in 1652. So that's Dutch East India? Yes, Dutch East India Company, yeah. Next, this is followed and overlaps with, this is the idea of entanglement, a system of British colonial and racial capitalism and a related system of British colonial and mineral capitalism. These are my ancestors. Okay, I come from this uh, settler colonial community, um, the British. And so my very identity is implicated in these systems. These are then followed by an intensified system of racial capitalism, building on the British, refining it in some respects, institutionalized by white Africana apartheid rule. The most recent prior to liberation form of, of a system of exploitation. And finally, a new system since 1990, of democratic capitalism, centered on a neoliberal, first world, non-racial capitalist enclave, about 30% of our population, that is disengaging itself from a large part of the black labor force, which makes up about 70% of our population. And for those of you interested, uh, the book I'm citing here by uh, Saint Peter Blanche is called A History of Inequality and is a remarkable, remarkable analysis, analysis of these particular systems. So what I want to say is that the Bible is implicated in each of these systems. It's entangled in each of these systems. Let's have a look, for example, at... Um, a quotation from Leendert Jans and Nicolaas Prut from 1649, writing to the Dutch East India Company, making an argument that they should establish a refreshment station at the Cape, the southern tip of Africa. This is what they say. By maintaining a good correspondence with them, that is the Africans, we shall be able in time to employ some of their children as boys and servants and to educate, educate them in the Christian religion, by which means, if it pleases God Almighty to bless this good cause, many souls will be brought to God and to the Christian reformed religion, so that the formation of the said fort and garden at the Cape will not only tend to the gain and profit of the Honorable Company, the Dutch East India Company, but to the preservation and saving of many men's lives, and what is more, to the magnifying of God's holy name and to the propagation of his gospel, whereby, beyond all doubt, your honor's trade over all India will be more and more blessed. 
it's fairly clear from my own analysis of this uh, early period at the Cape of, of Dutch colonialism, represented through the Dutch East India Company, that the Bible takes a back seat and, 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 and forms of reformed folk religion dominate. But the Bible hovers there as the authority behind this kind of folk religion. And uh, it's clear that the, the Bible and this folk religion is about profit, the profit of the Dutch East India Company. And there's not a lot of effort to um, missionize, to evangelize, to convert uh, local Africans. The primary focus is trade. But the Bible does hover, hover in the background. If we jump forward in time to the early 1800s, Africans, it was argued by Robert Moffat. Now, Robert Moffat is the first wave of um, non-conformist missionaries, those who don't belong to the state religion of the Dutch or the state religion of Britain. And they are they want to leave the periphery of southern Africa because it's controlled by these state forms of religion. And they want to go into the interior of Africa where they can share the gospel as they understand it. So they, this group is particularly interesting because you can chart to the day when the Bible appears within particular African communities, and that's been my interest. How is this Bible that the missionaries bring with them as forerunners of colonialism, which has not yet come, not yet come to the interior. How's the Bible received, engaged? How's it presented? How's it understood? Africans, it was argued by Robert Moffat, and others must be taught to turn away from their inefficient mode of production, cattle, so that using God's talents, they might bring forth the greatest possible abundance. Only then would black communities be animated by the spirit of commerce that, along with the gospel of Christ, promoted exchange on a worldwide scale. Only then might they be part of the sacred economy of civilized society. And I draw here, here on the very important work of Jean and John Komarov. What this period of, of missionary colonialism indicates is that the Bible, from being in the background, now takes center stage. The missionaries have very little success among the people of the interior. Very few people convert. Very few want to give up a cattle-based economy and move into an agricultural-based economy. Very few of them want to become a part of the emerging uh, industrial uh, capitalist world. And so the missionaries in the face of this rejection or, or, or disinterest, believe that as long as they, the Bible can be read, therefore it must be translated, as long as that is possible, they can leave the Bible and the Bible will do its own work. Imagining, they imagine, that what the Bible says is the same as what they say. That turns out not to be the case. But that's their assumption. If we move forward now from the um, 1800s into the emergence of apartheid in the um, early to mid uh, 1900s, this is a quotation from um, J.D. de Toy, um, a poet uh, who, who writes beautiful poetry. And as a young schoolboy, I can remember having to learn his poems off by heart. Uh, he was known as Toitius. That was his sort of nickname, Toitius. In advocating for apartheid, racial separation or segregation, the Afrikaner poet, Bible translator, and member of the Gereformierde Kerk, J.D. Dutoy, claims that he has no single biblical text to show that apartheid is biblical. I don't have a text but I have the Bible, the whole Bible. My argumentation would proceed from Genesis to Revelation. What is not properly understood, I don't think, is how important the Bible and 
Afrikaner theology was to the establishment of apartheid. It was rooted in a biblical and theological ideology. And Dutoy claims that the whole Bible is about separation. In Genesis 1, what does God do, he argues? God separates the light from the darkness, the land from the water. Separation, he argues, is at the root of God's creative activity. And he carries on like this. Whole Bible, he argues, is about segregation and separation. So apartheid is deeply rooted in the Bible. And so, I would argue, is our post-liberation context. This is a quotation from both Nelson Mandela and Thabo Mbeki, who followed Nelson Mandela. Our nation needs, both say, as a matter of urgency, an RDP of the, of the soul. An RDP of the soul. This is profoundly ironic and deeply disturbing. The RDP stands for the Reconstruction and Development Program. It is the economic program with which the African National Congress, our ruling party, the South African Communist Party, and the Confederation of South African Trade Unions came to power. They offered our people, as a tripartite alliance, the reconstruction and development program as a way beyond apartheid, as a liberating economic, macroeconomic project. Mandela and Thabo Mbeki are already beginning to pave the way through the use of the Bible. This becomes particularly clear with Thabo Mbeki, but is implicit in the very notion of an RDP of the soul in, in, in Mandela, and I make these arguments again in my book, The Sun and Bible, it's clear that the RDP is being separated out from economics and linked to spiritual matters. So that economic policy can veer off and align itself more closely with, with neoliberal capitalism, and the religion takes up the role of renewing the lives of South Africans individually and corporately, the souls of South Africans. So here, too, the Bible is part of the fabric of our current moment in post-liberation South Africa. My overall point, in other words, in looking at each of these periods very briefly, in our South African time of entanglement, the Bible is thoroughly entangled in and across these systemic moments. And for those interested, this is really a, a short summary of what I cover in my book, The Stolen Bible. What I want to move on to now, then, is to consider more specifically this notion of site of struggle and how it might be relevant for our post-liberation uh, movement moment. I want to look at how the church and theology have been considered sites of struggle. I think many of you will be familiar with the Kairos document, very, very significant uh, document that uh, was produced through community-based processes in 1985 and then the second edition in 1986. The very fact that there's a second revised edition shows that process was really important. There was a reception of the first one, and that, was, uh, that, that reception was received by those who were the drafters of this document, and many of the concerns were taken up in the second revised version in 1986. The Kairos document identified and analyzed three contending forms of church. There wasn't one church, there were three churches and theology. There wasn't one theology with a capital T, there were three theologies in the South Africa of the 1980s. State theology, church theology, and prophetic theology. Now let me say, as someone who was 
involved in the liberation struggle in those days, and Bev will, will bear testament to this, this helped us understand the realities that we faced. I was a minister in a church in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, and I was expelled from my church because of my involvement in the liberation struggle. Now, how does this make sense? How, how do you understand if there is one church and one theology that your church can expel you from it? Many of us could struggle to think of what was happening to us. It was happening to many of us, mainly black, but also some of us whites. And it was the Kairos document that gave us a language as, as, as it emerged, you say, oh, so that's it. How come the person who interrogates me when I'm detained is a Christian and challenges me as a Christian not to be where I am, and I challenge him not to be where he is? How can it be that Frank Ciccone is tortured by a deacon from his own church? How do you make sense of that? The Kairos document offered us a way of thinking about that. Sorry? I mean, this document is yeah. out in the... It is. Yeah, so what, what, what was the impact on the church in South Africa of the Kairos document? It, it was... The Kairos document really, I think, represented a... what we call the prophetic strand in the life of the church. I think large sectors of the church were uncomfortable with it, and the state banned it. Okay, let, let me just say a bit more about that. No, thank you. According to the Kairos document, state theology was identified as the, the theology of the South African apartheid state, which is, as the document says, simply the theological justification of the status quo apartheid with its racism, capitalism, and total totalitarianism. It blesses injustice, canonizes the will of the powerful, and reduces the poor to passivity, obedience, and apathy. More dangerous, I would argue, is church theology. And this was the genius, I think, of the Kairos document, to identify church theology. Church theology, it was argued, was in a limited, guarded, and cautious way critical of apartheid. Its criticism, however, is superficial and counterproductive because instead of engaging in an in-depth analysis of the signs of our times, it relies upon a few stock ideas derived from Christian tradition and then uncritically and repeatedly applies them to our situation. It's an acontextual theological approach. You can pick out Christian doctrines and apply them in different contexts as if they make sense in a different context. So it was church theology that asked me to leave my church. I should pray for the state, but I should not resist the state. The Kairos document deconstructs these two forms of theology and advocates for a prophetic theology, a theology which speaks to the particular circumstances of this crisis, apartheid, a response that does not give the impression of sitting on the fence, but is clearly and unambiguously taking a stand against the apartheid state. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay, James, that's fine. Thank you. L let me just summarize then some of the ways in which CITA struggle has been used, and it emerges out of what I've been saying. The Kairos document's a very good example of that. So, the concept CITA struggle has been an important socio theological concept in South African theology. I'm not using in creating a concept. It, it, it's there. It, it's part of the Kairos documents analysis, for example. So the concept side of struggle has been an important socio-theological concept in South African theology in the 1970s and 80s. The concept refers to the inherently conflicted or contested identity 
of a particular institution or discourse. Okay? Now, the Kairos document comes out of a particular strand of South African theology called South African contextual theology. This is really liberation theology, right? It, it wasn't called liberation theology because then it would have been banned. So you, you, you give yourself a few more years of not being banned uh, by calling yourself something different. So every, we all knew this was liberation theology. Latin American liberation theology was vibrant at the time. We had very close links with them. And um, for example, one of the first things Frank Chikane did when he became the Secretary General of the South African Council of Churches, is he sent me to Brazil to look at how the Bible was being used in the liberation struggle in Brazil and what we could learn from that. So there was um, you know, lots, of, lots of resonance there across these different liberation theologies, but our variant was called contextual theology. Now, contextual theology was clear that the church was a site of struggle, that theology was a site of struggle, and that biblical interpretation was a site of struggle, right? And we have something similar with South African feminist or South African women's theology. The, the, these, there's a debate about which of these terms is more useful, feminist or women's. For African feminist or women's theology, African theology is a site of struggle, African culture is a site of struggle, and biblical interpretation is a site of struggle. For South African black theology, in its first phase, biblical interpretation is a site of struggle in the 70s and early 80s, and then the Bible itself becomes a site of struggle. So as you notice there, the first articulation of the Bible itself, not biblical interpretation, but the Bible itself inherently, intrinsically, is a site of struggle. It is a text contending with itself. There is no single voice. There is no message. There is no gospel with a capital G. It is contestation all the way down. And a good example of this is contextual theology as an example. As I've said, the Kairos document was very significant. It was a product of the community-based processes of the Institute for Contextual Theology, the ICT, and articulated most clearly what was known as contextual theology a variant form of liberation theology. However, like African theology more generally, and I'll say a little bit more about that, contextual theology operated with the hermeneutics of trust towards the Bible. We can trust the Bible. The Bible's on our side. As we struggle against the apartheid, so the Bible is our companion, our resource. It, too, struggles against the apartheid. And we see this clearly. The Kairos document argued that the answer to the theological struggle against state theology and church theology was first to proclaim that our Kairos impels us to return to the Bible, emphasis, and to search the word of God for a message that is relevant to what we are experiencing in South Africa today. State theology, in other words, is not biblical. Church theology is not biblical. Prophetic theology is biblical. And then secondly, contextual theology, to proclaim that state theology generates its theological position by misusing theological concepts and biblical texts for its political purposes, misusing, and that the type of faith and spirituality that has dominated church life for centuries, now named church theology, has no biblical foundation. And of course, the problem is that both state theology and church theology do have a biblical foundation. That's the problem. But it was not perceived within contextual theology. And neither was it per perceived within African black 
and feminist theology in their early forms in the 1970s and early 80s. South African, African theology and South African black theology and South African African women's theology adopted a similar stance towards the Bible in the late 1970s and early 1980s. People like Gabriel Setlwane, Desmond Tutu, and Bernadette Tube are good examples of this trust towards the Bible. The Bible belongs to these theologies in the sense that doing theology without it, the Bible is inconceivable. The Bible's integral to these theologies. The Bible is perceived to be primarily on the side of the black African struggle for liberation and against apartheid. So you have this very clear consensus across our different liberation theologies that the Bible is on the side of the liberation struggle. The one, the one book you got when you were detained was a Bible. The one book you could have access to was a Bible. The state believed the Bible uh, was proclaiming a certain kind of message. And this was the, those who then read the Bible in their cells believed the Bible was claiming another message. The, what was the difference? Interpretation. No. Black theology said no. It's the Bible itself that is a problem. So from within black theology, a second phase asserted itself in the 1980s. This is, the, this is the, the phase following people like Desmond Tutu and Alan Bussock, people I think you may, you may know. And it's represented, for example, by Takatsu Mofu Keng and Itumaleng Masala. They rejected a hermeneutic of trust in the Bible and advocated for a hermeneutic of suspicion. It was not only biblical interpretation that was a site of struggle, but the Bible itself, inherently and intrinsically. Furthermore, and this is where we go in the next couple of weeks in these lectures. Furthermore, Masala warned a failure to recognize the Bible as a site of struggle would lead to alliances being formed between contemporary ruling class elites and the ruling class elites of the final form of the Bible as we have it. Which is where we will be going in the next lecture. Masala's warning, I want to argue, has not been heeded. And the dominant ideologies of the Bible have been co-opted by an alliance of the dominant sectors of the state and the dominant sectors of the churches in contemporary South Africa. In my book, The Stolen Bible, I talk about the ways in which Mandela, Thabo Mbeki, Jacob Zuma, and our new president, I was prophetic, Cyril Ramaphosa, have used the Bible. Cyril Ramaphosa is using the Bible in exactly the same way as those who have gone before him. So it is important, I would argue, to revisit Masala's understanding of the Bible as a site of struggle. Uh, I will also want to show how, I'm, how that notion can be imp important for the kind of community-based work one does with poor and marginalized communities, the kind of work I'm involved in and have been for the last 30 years. This is the focus of the next lecture then, the Bible as a site of struggle in South African black theology. What did Masala mean by this idea that the Bible itself was a site of struggle? And significantly, at the same time as the Bible is being recognized as a site of struggle, culture, gender, health, and sexuality are also becoming sites of struggle alongside race and class. So that is where we will go 
next week for those of you who are interested. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you very much indeed, Gerald, for that extremely interesting paper, uh, paper this evening. We have, let's see, just under 15 minutes for any questions or points for discussion that you may have. And um, David Toombs is going to uh, hover around uh, to give you the microphone um, so that we can record uh, the conversation that emerges. Hello, um, my name's Catriona and I go to a Presbyterian church in Dunedin. Um, my ancestors settled um, in 1820 okay. in um, Port Elizabeth. Okay. Um, Mine too. <laughs> we might have been on the same ship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... There's so many questions, but the Dutch Reformed Church... Um, it kind of dominates your um, view of theology um, and, and also it kind of affected the politics um, and the um, vervoed is that the right way? vervoed the vervoed vervoed yeah vervoed yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and, and that kind of yeah. Um, Africana. Um, so, what was the place of Methodism and um, English in um, apartheid South Africa? What was the church doing? The I don't mean. I just mean that the non-Dutch Reformed Church. What were they actually doing? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your question, and also thank you for your interruptions. Uh, and no, 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 thank you, because it, I really do want this series of lectures to be a form of dialogue, and you created that sense. Uh, I think James was probably correct to ask you to hold off, but, but, but uh, I do want this to be a, a discussion, I really do. The book I'm imagining is not yet formed, and I'm, I, so, so the kinds of these engagements I think are really important, so thank you for that. Um, there's a really interesting book by a, a colleague of mine, uh, James Cochran is his name, called Servants of Power. And he, the book looks at the role of the English-speaking churches in, under apartheid, Catholic, uh, Anglican, Methodist, the, the, the mainline churches, what we call settler-initiated churches. African-initiated churches, settler-initiated churches. You're on my settlers. Okay. Um, Servants of Power is a devastating critique, I think, of white English-speaking Christianity, main, main, mainline Christianity. He demonstrates in the book that although all of these churches were able to make statements that were against apartheid, that they never quite escaped what the Kairos document many years later would refer to as church theology. Because my grandfather and my grandmother had my parents, my mother and my uncles educated in non-state schools. Right. Because the state theology was not one they wanted. So right. although they are Methodists, they educated them in a Catholic primary okay. school okay. so that they would not have... Right. Yeah. yeah, and also the advantage of those schools, and there are many disadvantages. Don't get me started on private schools. But, uh, but the, one of the advantages were that they were non-racial. Yeah. Uh, they were uh, classist economically, right? But they were, they were non-racial. So they have started to break the mold, I think, to some extent. But part of my response is, and this is what Cochrane is arguing in Servants of Power, it's well worth reading, it's, it's, a great, it's a great book, is that the, the English-speaking churches were never able to break the system 
right? They could make these uh, momentary uh, proclamations, and, and they're good proclamations, but they weren't able to resist the system. Things like um, group areas, people living in different areas, right? Having to go to church in different areas. You can imagine the church saying, no, we won't do that. Did the churches do that? No. There's a black Methodist church in the same city as there's a colored Methodist church in the same city as there's a white Methodist church. How did the church allow that to happen? It's that kind of thing that Cochran explores. The, the church never wanted quite to alienate itself from power. The white English-speaking church. Thank you. I have a question uh, coming. You're, you're speaking here into a culture in which the Bible is not stolen, but recumbent. Yes. Uh, and does that mean that there are no marginalized groups in this society, or that somehow the church has not related to these marginalized groups? It's, it's a huge difference. I mean, the Bible, except in, uh, within limited church circles, is not seen here okay. as a site of struggle. Right. Um, thank you for that. And, and I'm, I'm very pleased to have some engagement with your context. It's a context I don't know that well, um, but I'm keen to, to learn. Um, in our context, the Bible is everywhere. Okay, so the kind of work I do, uh, working with poor and marginalized communities, I'm not, I'm not a missionary to poor and marginalized communities. The Bible's already there. And the kind of work that my colleagues and I do, and, and all my other colleagues, all those I work with are, are black South Africans. The work we do is because of invitations from those communities. In other words, their own faith formations are not always engaging the issues they would want to engage with. And I'll talk more about that in the lectures that come. And so we get invited in to talk about HIV or, or, or sexuality or unemployment, things that churches won't engage with, even today. Um, and so it, it's a vibrant uh, reality. Uh, for example, one of the projects that emerged at the university uh, that, that we work with is with those who clean our buildings. The cleaners, the cleaners in our buildings, right? Those invisible people who make sure the lecture halls get it and clean the toilets. These cleaners um, gravitated towards the kind of work we're doing. Why? Because we were dealing with issues that they lived with. And we began a, a Bible study group with the cleaners during their lunchtime. And they were then stopped having lunchtime together because the, those who managed them didn't like this idea because they started to unionize based on our Bible studies. So that's a longer story, but a very interesting one. I'm trying to show that here among cleaners, who are this invisible people, the Bible was present, and we resonated around the Bible. The Bible creates what we say is a safe, uh, sequestered site where we can, we, it, it creates a space where we can engage with these very things. Now, I don't know what role the Bible would play in, a, in, in New Zealand. I'd be interested in some of the migrants that are coming here from, who, who might be Christian, for example, uh, who, who come to New Zealand. Because I imagine the Bible's still very present among them. Okay. How do they engage with the society where the Bible's very marginal? Uh, we've done quite a bit of work in post-Christian contexts. Scotland, Norway, uh, and also in, in, in uh, inter-religious contexts where Christianity is a minority religion, India. And, and I think there are ways in which, if the Bible is at all present, if the Bible is at all present, it should still, I think, be engaged with as a site of struggle. Thanks for that Thank wonderful you. lecture. Thank you. This is just a point of clarification. I've missed something. Masala, yes. did he write the, or was involved in the Kairos document? No. It's, good. it's a very good question, actually, yeah. Um, no. So 
So um, in the 19, late 70s and, and early 80s, you had two major forms of liberation theology. Contextual theology, which produced the Kairos document, and black theology, of which Mosale is one of the key voices, particularly of the second phase, what I'm calling the second phase of black theology. Okay. Now, Mosala was critical of the Kairos document for a number of reasons. I think it was seen that the Kairos document was um, echoed too much of Latin American liberation theology and not enough of South African black theology. They didn't, he didn't hear his, his own tradition as clearly as he would like within the Kairos document. He was also suspicious of any theology that spoke of reconciliation. So, the, so, so theologies of reconciliation, even the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, were heavily criticized by black theologians. Um, Mosala was also critical of not enough economic analysis. Uh, so although contextual theology does have a strong economic focus, it was not sufficient, I think, for Mosala. And then, as I said, fundamentally, he just thought their view of the Bible was wrong. The Bible was a site of struggle, and the Kairos document identifies all the other sites of struggles, but misses out this very key one, and so therefore becomes captive to it, imagining that simply by interpreting the Bible properly, we can get rid of the state theology and get rid of church theology. Not recognizing, he would say, they're in the Bible. That is the problem. There will always be possibilities of state theology. There will always be potential for church theology. Why? It's in the Bible. So you've got to realize that the Bible itself is the problem. And you've got to find a way of, 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 of hearing the voices of liberation in the Bible. And the problem is they've already been co-opted by dominant ideologies. So how do you hear them? That's his argument. He says if you don't do that, you imagine, and he says this to Desmond Tutu and Alan Bussock and others, if you don't do that, you end up taking the oppressor's voice as the biblical voice. And it might be OK for a week or two weeks, but in the long term, that oppressor's voice will always be oppressive. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, the Bible has to be spiritually Yes. Yes. He would hesitate with the word spiritual. OK. He would, he would want to, he would, he would want to use what he calls historical materialist uh, categories to get behind the spiritual. Okay. So he's not against the spiritual discernment as long as it's a spirituality of liberation, but that spiritually, spirituality of liberation must then take up certain kinds of tools. He's very strong on method, and I'll talk more about this next week. Thanks very much, Gerald. That was fascinating. Thank um, you. Thank you. I, I, you might just have answered my, the, the question in your last response, but I'm still quite curious about just connecting the dots between your last point about Cyril Ramaphosa's use of the Bible yeah. and your first slide, the anecdote of the, um, the land and the, and the Bible, in light of the breaking news just today, I think, about Parliament's decision um, it, well, it voted in favour of land expropriation yes. without compensation. Yes. Yes. So yes. I'm just quite curious about how, how you would interpret this reclamation of land. Right. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, in response to the question you asked earlier on, one of the other problems that Mosala had with contextual theology and a lot of black theology of his time is it did not engage the land question. So, so he was one of those, um, so Masala also does not align himself with the African National Congress. He, he, he comes, he, he was a part of Azapo, the Azanian People's Organization, which is a um, significant but very small political party in our context, which is fragmented 
um, unfortunately, a few times. In fact, Musala was president of Zappa uh, for, for a period. Now, for Musala, the land issue is a fundamental issue. And he's done some really interesting work on how we might engage the Bible as a site of struggle around the issue of land. But very, very little other work has been done on that. And I think what has frustrated many post-apartheid is that although we have fairly progressive legislation about land expropriation, it's just not being implemented. And so at the most recent uh, conference of the African National Congress, where Ramaphosa was elected as president, it was made absolutely clear that there could be no longer any dithering around this issue. So it's not what Parliament has accepted is not something new. It's the legislation's already there, that in, in cases where um, fair compensation is rejected, you can then take the land, right? You, you, don't, you don't have to keep arguing. You, you can expropriate the land. Um, and the mechanisms are in place for that, but very little of that's been done. And I think what the ANC and our Parliament have said is that we are going to implement this now. Uh, there's lots of jitteriness around this, and I think a fair amount of um, uh, fear that is unfounded. I, 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 think, I think there's a real commitment. It came out very strongly at the African National Cong Congress's, uh, Congress um, that it's not a kind of Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe context where you, you give, you take the land and just give it to others as a patronage system. You hand out land so that you, you, others owe you a favor, okay? Land, if it's going to be expropriated, must be expropriated for, for, for significant reasons. In other words, it's, it's there for agriculture or for development or whatever. And the ANC was very clear about that. Even some of the most militant who came out of that, that conference were very um, at pains to make it clear that this was not a willy-nilly expropriation, but a very deliberate one that must be carefully consulted, but it must be done in the end. And, and even it's gone as far as to be talking about expropriating land from traditional leaders. That is going to be a very interesting uh, situation. And uh, Butlezi from the Encarta Freedom Party has already said, if you do it, we will we'll rise up. So, so there the are concerns, but I think it's simply well, not simply, I think it's, it's an affirmation of something that should have been done a long time ago. Um, and by delaying and delaying and delaying, you've created the sense that land is inviolate. You can't, you know, it, it, we can just sit with the land situation as we have it. Uh, but, but for example, and sorry to prolong this, but one of the things we've not had until recently is a land audit. Who owns what land? So for example, how much land does the state own? And, and, and until you know that, you can't speak meaningfully of expropriation. So it's clear from the recent land audit that the state owns a lot of land. Now, you don't have to expropriate that land. You've got the land already, but what are you going to do with that land? And I think these are some of the questions. But land is a fundamental issue. It's, it's, um, to be African is to be connected to your land. But what does that mean for Abatlali Basim Jundola, the people who live in the shacks in Durban, who don't want rural land, don't want to be farmers. They want urban land. And so that's the kind of debate I think we need to move into. It's not giving me my ancestral land in, in, in the rural areas. It's I want access to this land in the inner city. Uh, we've done some interesting work on notions of the kingdom of God. We, we don't call it the kingdom of God, we call it the kingdom of God, right? To avoid the hierarchical, patriarchal language. But what would your view of the kingdom of God be if you were rural, poor South African? And what would your view of the kingdom of God be if you were poor, urban South African? 
And you have these two different pictures. And I think land expropriation has to serve both those, those visions, both those yearnings. Thank you.